Corey's got a bit of that. There are some high school kids who bully him, and he's like 25 or something like that. They're really mean to him. He uh, kills the fuck out of them. Oh, yeah. And then he kills... And fucks up their car. Yes. Even worse. Brunch! Hit it, boys! We are packed to the gills right now, Pete. We have so much stuff to do this fucking show. Yeah. I hate it. Yeah, we sure do. Uh, it's one of the rare times that we enter into a brunch episode and we're like concerned about... Too much. Concerned about having time to talk about everything instead of like, wow, we got to fill 60 minutes and then get the fuck out of here. Huh? Off the top. <laughs> yeah. And then add in commercials to get it to 60 minutes. Yeah. Uh, the big thing I was gonna, we were gonna off the top be able to do like, I don't know, like forty five minutes on James Corden being. Um, I'm not saying this. The Brits are saying this. James Corden's the c word. I know. I, I I feel like the rule should be if you're talking about a British person, you should be allowed to use it, dude. Yeah. So we've discussed this in early episodes. I don't really use. Uh, I don't, by and large, I don't really ever use the C word, but I don't really use the B word as a noun just because it's oh, my own thing. I use the B word all the time. I now. know, but like I, I, I use it or I, I associate it with like just like angry, bad dudes saying it about women and that. So, so like that, that, that that's just always been a that's, thing. But that's, why I, that's but. why I like to use it because I like to use it. I like to reclaim it. Yeah. I like to reclaim calling somebody a bitch. And like I will, I will rarely ever call. A woman a bitch oh no because i like to be able to use it to call anybody a bitch we would do it in early episodes don't go to early episodes and like cancel us or whatever <laughs> but i i liked using it and we liked using it to call men who would be upset by being called that word yes because they'd be like i'm no bitch that's well, for also, chicks nothing hits like a very well pronounced bitch like what a little bitch okay Easy. So I'm like now you're getting into like why I don't say it, but uh, no, but I think it works if you're using it in the right spot. I've been doing so much more Brit speak, mm -hmm. mainly because I don't know, like my the YouTubers that are being pushed on me right now are British. Okay. So um, I don't know if you noticed. I've been saying I've been referring to the period between 2000 and 2009 as much as possible because I really like using the word. Naughties. N O U G H T I E S. That's what Brits call the aughts. Okay. Naughties. All right. Or, I don't know, I, I do say bloody and stuff like that, but it lends itself to it's like, all right, so then the next thing you should say. Yeah, you got to graduate to the C word. I did. I, I will be honest. I don't know if I actually said it or if I said the C word, but uh, there's a former. Red Sox manager uh, yes. who was in the playoffs recently is no longer. And I was watching a game with a friend and I said, I'm rooting for him, but he is the biggest. He He's such a C word. He's not a nice guy. He's just a, I guess you could say he's a cock, but that, like, that, that guy's an asshole. Mm -hmm. So like, that's where Brits would just be like, he's the C word. Anyway, James Corden apparently is the C word. Yeah, and apparently it's like I mean I had heard rumblings and stuff, but never yes. never any real like uh, I didn't care to find any stories or anything. But the stories are coming out this week, and I'm fucking obsessed. I am obsessed with just reading about the stories about how bad of a dude this guy is. Was it Eric Andre who said uh, when yeah. when people canceled Ellen, he was like, "You're canceling Ellen for being an asshole." He was like. Some people just suck and are mean. And he was like, and if you're going to cancel people for being assholes, James Corden is ruined. Yeah. And I, I do think that Eric Andre has a point where it's like, all right, yeah, there are people that are just like mean people and bad people. And it doesn't mean that like they shouldn't work or in, and stuff like that. But like they sh you should be you should be recognized for being a, a, a terrible person or like. So being like, called like, out for being terrible. The terrible person. Th so let's go to that former Red Sox manager. I don't think he's like an abusive guy or anything. That's like horrible. He's just not nice to people. And I've yeah. seen the way that he's just treats people who he feels aren't on his level. And that's mm -hmm. just such an easy way. It's similar to the Corden thing. Like, well, that's, he's probably that's, mean to waiters. 
Yeah, yeah, fair. Yeah, like that. But that's that's why I like to to know those things. Like if you if 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 it's an isolated situation and like you're kind of short with somebody or you don't have like the most pleasant interaction. But if there are like repeated stories of you being horrible and like abusive to to like people who have less power, I'm whether be a it's dick to you because waiters, I can. Sort yeah, of thing. right. Yeah, yeah. It, like that. I want to know about that stuff because I think you can tell a lot about a person how they treat like a waiter, um, uh, somebody who they have power over, like how they treat uh, how they would that treat work for them. Better call Saul. How they would treat Mike when he's a ticket taker. Yeah, like are they right. giving that guy the time of day? Because mm-hmm. Mike, famously, really friendly guy, easy to get along with. So if you're going and barking orders at him, I know as uh, as. Tim Robinson says, and I think you should leave. That guy yells. <laughs> no, we shouldn't hire that guy. That guy yells. Uh, so by now, everyone's heard the story of the restaurant in New York City. But uh, you pointed me to this uh, Reddit post, which was, hey, James, you won't remember me, but my friends sat at a table. This is three years ago. Next to you and Harry Styles, plus some others in Manchurian Legends in London's Chinatown about six years ago. We didn't bother you, but you were a massively entitled the C word and yelled and treated the wait staff like shit. And when one of my party politely suggested you calm down, you got really aggressive and threatening in a chubby way, like a boozy panda. That's the best. So my question is, why did Harry seem so cool while you were such a massive throbbing bellend? That's some, that, uh, I, I need to look up what bellend means, by the way, because I'll use that if it's not super bad. It sounds like... If I had to guess, asshole. Bell end. Yeah. yeah. Asshole. Yeah. I don't know. But I mean, English people are hilarious with the way that they talk. Calling somebody, uh, saying that somebody was threatening in a uh, a chubby way and then calling them a boozy panda is fucking hilarious. That sounds like that's like John. That person's a John Mulaney fan. Hell That's yes. like John Mulaney yeah. phrasing. All right. A bell end is, uh, of course, we didn't know what this, so we couldn't figure this out. It's the tip of the penis. Ah. Uh, uh, can also be used as an insult. Only that does Britain. make sense. Uh, the tip of a penis is in the shape of a bell for yeah, some it's people. Like the end of a bell. Yeah. Bell, bell end. Okay. Wow. Uh, <laughs> only Britain has been, this is the, from the, the definition on Urban Dictionary. Only Britain has been blessed with this amazing <laughs> word so far, but the gods, hyperlinked, are trying to find a way to spread it around the entire world. So that's our assignment as brunch, uh, the brunch world, is that we're uh, bringing, we're bringing bell end. To yeah. To the domestic side. All right. So the example of it is a uh, random person. I dressed up as death at, or I dress up as death and point at old people as they leave the bingo center. Me, you bell end. <laughs> oh, my God. That's really good. Hey, let's keep the conversation going with uh, British people, because currently there are two albums. Only half also, of this. Wait, 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 br- one, one second. I, I just want to say James Corden should have been canceled this second. That uh, he did that flash mob for whatever fucking movie that was. Um, oh, he does that all the time where he stops traffic. Yes. Uh, what was it? The, what was it though? Um, it was like the princess movie. Um, shit. Not uh, into the woods. No. It was the. It was like the actual like Cinderella. I think it was. Okay. Cinderella and he did. Uh, they did like the flash mob stop traffic and he was in that rat costume and he like went up to somebody's window and just like shook his dick right in their face oh i was like the second that that happens that guy should never get to work again so james corden fell firmly into by the way we are flying coffee wise we're just pounding coffee speaking super fast yeah, oh yeah. love this <laughs> this is energy baby uh i like that james corden existed he fell f- firmly into like the glad he exists because he makes my parents happy and that's fucking awesome i want my parents to be happy and a lot of people were happy they like the carpool karaoke thing it made me want to die a little bit, but mm-hmm. whatever. Not everything is for everybody. But I, the second you find out that guy is a bell end, yes, gotta go, pal. Yeah, it's, sorry it, to see. It's like for for a long time, him and Trevor Noah were like the two most overexposed people that I just wanted off my TV at all times. But I think that Trevor Noah is probably uh, a a good hang. But nobody was telling you to watch Trevor Noah shit. Nobody was like, oh, my God. Yeah, but if you watch award shows, you have to watch Trevor Noah shit. He's in your face. So Trevor Noah, you're right. Trevor Noah was being pushed on you by the man, whereas uh, James Corden infiltrated your actual social circles, where somebody that you know likes Trevor Noah, or I'm sorry, likes James Corden and is like, did you see when he did the thing with Harry Styles? 
No, but I'm going to say no to this time because I know that the next five minutes somebody else is going to ask me and then they're going to show it to me. So I'm just yeah. going to save it for later. Uh, I'll say this quickly on Trevor Noah. Why does everyone like defend him of like, well, he's not funny, but he's smart. So when do you need to be fucking smart to be on TV? <laughs> yeah. All yeah. the best people on TV are fucking stupid. All the best like <laughs> entertainers and shit. Fucking Feidelberg comes up with shit where I'm like, yo, he turned his brain yo. off to come to that. And that's and he, like that is entertaining me. You know, you know who Trevor Noah is? Who? Mac Jones. Yeah, but nobody likes Trevor Noah. That's, people talk themselves into liking. That's true. That's no, true. But, 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 but you know what I'm saying, right? Yeah, like, people like, like defend him. They're like, so he, much. but he's smart. He may not be the most talented, but he's smart. And he, he'll he'll get the job done. And it's like, well, why can't I get somebody who's smart and also good? And if if this if this is gonna if we're gonna complete the Mac Jones analogy, which I think is astute, then we call him smart, we call him smart, and then you cut to the daily show. And Trevor Noah's like walking over to his desk and he's got like a binder full of stuff he's supposed to do. And he's like, I thought, and he drops it. <laughs> and there's like cake on his face. And you're like, oh, he looks really stupid though. <laughs> yeah, Why is he dropping everything? <laughs> oh, the so show starts and he's like, all right, when do we, when do we do the thing where we rub the cake on each other's face? Like, dude, you, you are. This is not a wedding. Why is this guy so dumb? He he, he like eats eighty percent of the cake and then smashes the final twenty percent into his eyeballs. Yeah. So Trevor Noah, Mac Jones, and yeah, it's maybe like, not the guy. Is he sm like? I don't watch enough Trevor Noah. He's got a nice accent and he's well spoken. There's a huge difference. I definitely know this from the from working in the biz. There is a massive difference between well-spoken and smart. A lot of Correct. smart people aren't well-spoken, which is totally fine. And a lot of well-spoken people are fucking stupid. There are a lot of examples. I'm not going to give them. <laughs> we don't have the time, and I don't want to sound like I'm dragging anybody. But you, uh, like, if I need to for, if I need to for one minute. I can be the most well-spoken motherfucker in the world. Yeah, and I won't I, make a lick of sense. I mean, it's like having a nice-looking car, but like the ins it'll break down after like twenty thousand miles. It's a lemon. It's a <laughs> yeah, real right. lemon. Okay, so we're in a pickle here because we're going to talk music. Fuck it. We'll just do it the the way that we were originally going to do it because I think we have so much energy that we're just going to be able to fly through it. Uh, get on the Patreon, patreon.com slash listen to brunch because this week's bonus content is fucking awesome. If you don't know, on Friday, there are new records being released by both Taylor Swift and Carly Rae Jepsen. We are going to have the most instant, instant reaction episode you've ever heard in your freaking life because as soon as they come out, Pete is going to listen to the Carly Rae Jepsen record. I'm going to listen to the Taylor Swift record and we will immediately podcast and tell each other about it we flipped a coin pete got crj i got taylor just kidding it was kind of predetermined it makes more sense though pete's going to be more passionate when he gives the crj rundown i'm going to be a little more analytical uh with the taylor swift thing so it just kind of serves both of what you actually probably don't want from brunch but you're going to get it no but i think that it, it more appropriately appropriately fits each artist because like people love to break down Taylor shit stuff. Yeah. And uh for me it's Carly Ray Jepsen's just about the vibes. Yeah. So uh, I'm gonna be showing up most likely just being like, yeah, sounds pretty good. Cool party. G gonna enjoy this album. And then you're gonna be like, well here's what happened in the time signature in the second song. <laughs> I go well, I'll tell you what happened in the time signature it was in fucking four four. And I I almost went through the the thing was that did you see the uh the credits were posted last yeah, night. Yeah. Um, I was going to quote tweet it with, I hate that I know how half of these songs sound or how they go because a lot of them are just Taylor Swift and Jack Antonoff. But I didn't. I was nice. Instead, I just screen grabbed all of the by Taylor Swift and Jack Antonoff by Taylor Swift and Jack Antonoff and posted, don't ever say Taylor Swift hasn't faced adversity. I do. I do want to give Taylor Swift some credit here. She has successfully achieved the most uninteresting album rollout of all time oh my god it is the antithesis is that how it works yeah of uh of Opposite? sob rock yeah like, oh i mean no one's gonna touch sob rock as far as Mark sob goes. rock had the most interesting rollout and intriguing rollout to the point where i was like the album could never li live up to the expectations but now taylor swift is just like hey here are the song titles and who worked on them Okay, and man, like Ezra Koenig has said this on Time Crisis before, where 
some, some one of his songs will come up and he'll talk about it a bit and then he'll be like I'm not I don't like saying what it's about though because I like for uh, everybody to kind of have their own relationship with it but I think what he means is like I don't want to make it not cool I don't want to like flood you with information this is what because then you're like oh like who oh, so it's just about this mm-hmm. whatever you like to keep a little bit of mystique uh but we have famously kind of sat out the rollout of this taylor swift midnight's album so have we're gonna we get, though i have i haven't watched any of that shit i didn't know there was anything to watch which is shocking she yes so you've sat it out she's posted she's done these like midnight things where she reveals the name of a song and then but that's what i'm saying nobody who cares about that shit some taylor swift fans have told me they don't care but because taylor swift fandom is a cult crazy, yeah. a lot of people do so uh, also uh, your wires drive me crazy it's why dra- draping oh. over your shoulder all right well and now a word from our pals at DraftKings. Hockey fans, famously, it's finally time to hit the ice. And thanks to DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NHL, you're in for the season of a lifetime. New customers can bet $5 on any team and get $200 in free bets if they win. Uh, you know the Boston Bruins, our Boston Bruins, are the hottest team in the league right now. Uh, so you may want to go in on the Bruins, scoring five-plus goals a game, and uh, cash in on that. If that wasn't enough excitement, you can turn to small bets into bigger payouts with the same game parlays. Combine multiple bets, like which team will win, how many goals they'll they'll score, and uh, more for your shot at an even bigger payout. DraftKings is safe, secure, and reliable. You can deposit and withdraw your cash whenever you want. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app right now using promo code WASHED and bet $5 on any NHL team to win their game and get $200 in free bets if they win. That's code WASHED at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NHL. Minimum age and eligibility restrictions apply. See show notes for details. We're going to get Nora on the horn because uh, she's going to catch us up on everything we've missed. So uh, let's give her a buzz. First time we've used this calling feature, by the way. Hello. Hey, Nora. What's up? Hello, DJ. Hey, Nora. Not much. Hi, Pete. Uh, Hello, first, French boys. first question. Do you know what a bell end is? No. A bell end? Have you ever been to London? Yes. I don't know. People cut. It's like a derogatory term. People will say like, oh, that bloke's a bellend. Oh, this right. is news to me. Anyway, catch us up <laughs> on this rollout of uh, the Midnight's thing because we've kind of sat out all of the the drawings and uh, revealings of the song titles, but it's been a very busy time for hardcore Swifties. So as Midnight's is coming out, what have we missed? Oh, DJ, I'm so tired. Um, <laughs> all right. I'm so, simply so tired. Uh, it's coming out on Thursday night or Friday morning, whatever. Midnight. Midnight Thursday is what I would call it. Um, let's see. It's it's a concept album. Uh, each song is about a sleepless night throughout our girl Tay Tay's life. Um, there's, there's 13 tracks. There's going to be a bonus edition with two remixes and then one other song. Uh, everything is weird. They're posting a lot of lyrics on billboards in various cities. And I think some of the younger Swifties who are better at computers than I am seem able to figure out what city the billboard is going to be in and therefore know what time zones midnight they have to wait to. I am not good at this, which is another reason why I am so very tired. Um, Lana Del Rey is on a song. Zoe Kravitz is involved. Yes. Uh, and Jack Antonoff is the main producer, which I'm sure brought DJ just like oodles of joy. Yeah. So it's it's funny. A lot of people react to the Zoe Kravitz thing. Zoe Kravitz does a little bit of singing, but I guess she kind of yeah, hasn't. she's got a band. Musical yeah. family. Yeah. Hasn't been famously. Hasn't really been in the, uh, the Taylor Swift world yet. But uh, you kind of answered the question by explaining what people are doing with time zone stuff. But. 
Has the reading into Taylor Swift stuff and looking for Easter eggs reached its apex? Because we've gotten a lot of moments, what we call a police station or hospital, where somebody is digging into Taylor Swift stuff so much that they have to either go to a police station or a hospital and they get to choose. But what they're doing is just like it's, it's too much. And maybe the thing isn't even there. So you said, has it reached its apex? Yes. I don't know the answer to that. Jesus. I'm worried that there is still further that we could Jesus. go. Has it gone too far? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. We are all through the looking glass. Um, there are phones. There were, there were TikToks where she would reveal the, the song titles. Um, and she would speak into a phone, and sometimes the phone was upside down, and this is very significant, and sometimes the phone is in her right hand, and sometimes it's in her left hand. The problem is, I think the, the, the tail has started to wag the dog a little bit, because the, the um, TikToks with the song titles were coming out in this very orderly, every other midnight another one would be released pattern, and then all of a sudden, she dumped, like, the last five or six of them at once. And it seemed like there were some leaks of track lists and whatever. It just seemed like something happened. It, it was weird. And there's too much to read into. I'm sure most of it is not worth reading anything into. But because there are certainly some things that are clues, everybody looks at everything. And um, I saw a tweet recently that was like, Taylor Swift fandom is QAnon for people who were a yes, pleasure to have in yes. class. I almost said it to and you. I really, I was, yeah. Nope. I was like, all right, I got to go take a look in the mirror. <laughs> I, I always feel like with anything Taylor Swift related, and Nora, you're, you're a dear friend. I'm always afraid to like make that joke or send you that tweet because it's known that you are, by the way, famously, Nora has a full-time job covering the NFL, which is a very exhausting like thing but famously you are now people's kind of point person for all things taylor swift so i will say i i think i do not always give um the taylor swift fandom tons of credit for being Good. i guess self-aware is the wrong <laughs> term but like rational about taylor I do actually think that the fan base deserves some credit for being self-aware about themselves. I think everybody knows that we're behaving in an insane and irrational way. Cult. That's yeah. I mean, that's fair because like all the Taylor Swift fans that I know, like super fans, are like, "Oh yeah, I'm I'm crazy," but like, yeah, they don't have awareness about like in the how, name of my God, though. So it's okay. right. <laughs> yeah. So like, they don't have awareness uh, about Taylor Swift. They have awareness about themselves. Yes. Yes. That's not. I think that's right. That's not bad. Uh, how do you think this album's going to sound? Because uh, Aaron Dessner, not involved in this project, as you said. Uh, well, except then he tweeted something cryptic the other day. So fucking now a. He tweeted like things are not always what they seem, or something like that. And Maybe he's William like, Bowery. I go to bed. Maybe he's William Bowery. <laughs> Nora, would it have? Would the internet have gotten mad if I started a rumor that William Bowery was Doctor Luke? Would they have handled that cool or no? No, definitely not. No. Yes, uh, good absolutely thing. not. Good thing I, I DJ sat texted on me that. that yesterday, and I was like, "Dude, this is a bad idea." And he was like, "No, no, no, but you don't get it. It's a joke." And I was like, "I get it. People will kill you." Um, it, I I thought that it was weird that Aaron Dessner was not. Uh, at least forward facing involved in this album because so, it does finish your thought, yeah. Uh, because like this has all the the stinkings of being <laughs> Taylor Swift's saddest album yet, uh, and like if you're not if you're working with the guy from the National and then you kick him off the project for like your most sad project, it's weird. Doesn't doesn't so, line up. Okay, let's 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 take out the weather. It's going to be. Sad girl. Um, oh, it is. Vibes. Let's let's take that out for a second. I, I actually think it makes. I, I think it makes some sense that he's not involved because think about how folklore and Evermore were made. He wrote that music, sent it to her, and then she wrote melodies and lyrics on top of that stuff, which is how she's done some songs in studios in the past. But it's a, it it is kind of a different 
process. Like he had finished files, shipped a bunch of them over, and she was like, okay, let me noodle around with this stuff. Oh, okay, let's do an album. It's a pretty distinct work process that now that the constraints of writing in quarantine don't exist, it wouldn't really make sense to continue. I'm really curious to see if, because there's a lot of speculation, it seems pretty likely that she's going to go on tour next summer, if he's involved with the tour and in what capacity, just because I'm, I don't know how those songs translate to like playing in a football stadium, but that era, if we call, you know, folklore and evermore, it had a distinct sound. And part of the reason it had that distinct sound was because they made it in this very specific way. If they're not working that way anymore, I, I kind of get why there would be a clean break. Um, yeah, that's fair. The like the starting is like, point is different. Please give me though, right. please fucking give me a Taylor Swift tour in which the national opens. Because if you go from Charlie XCX and Camila Cabea <laughs> Cabello. to Cabello to Cabello. Cabello. Fuck me. Yeah. Uh, I'm such Cabello. a bell end to uh, the national Taylor Swift fans trying to talk themselves into liking the national <laughs> would be my favorite people watching experience ever. I do not want that. To I, <laughs> I want it so bad. I, I want it to be, uh, I would actually, it would be awesome if it was uh, the big red machine. If it was, mm. uh, Aaron Dessner well, that's and Bonnie like, Vare. Okay. Like, yeah, like <laughs> that's actually pretty good. <laughs> yeah. I would love that just to see because uh, it, it gets weird. So, I mean, but yeah, to having Taylor Swift fans also be very in on the national would be very funny. Um, This Taylor Swift fan is not very in on the national. Although Same. I, you know, I like Same. what we've done together. But um, it's also like, it, it just depends if, uh, like, if she does this tour, if it ends up being like sort of residencies and cities and maybe she can play different venues and, and whatever. Like if they play that at a concert hall, I guess I get it. Just like what happens if it's Aaron Desner and Bonnie Bear and it's like 8 30 PM in Gillette stadium. Like <laughs> be so the weird. vibes are the weird. weirdest vibes. I famously have never done psychedelics, but you bet your bippy. Oh, I am yeah. shelling out for field seats and doing all of the psychedelics. <laughs> Just, don't talk about my bippy like that. <laughs> that would be fucking incredible. I'll say this: like, I'm I'm very intrigued to hear these songs, Nora, because with it mainly just being co-writes with Jack Antonoff. Jack Antonoff's strength, I think, is that he kind of enables and lets people go in the direction that they want to go in. And yeah. I think a lot of Taylor's best music is. With a great musician like a Max Martin, where they're going to polish up and make all the music very sophisticated and fun and as technically sound as it can be. And Taylor focuses on the lyrics and works on melodies, which like melodically, she's not exactly a genius, but she writes good lyrics. And it's a that's a winning combination, a great musician and Taylor doing the lyrics and I, I, that's overstating it because they or it's oversimplifying it because they'll they'll both help up with other things. Jack is more what do you want to do? Let me help you execute that. And I think that worked best crazily on reputation. Like I love that this is why we can't have nice things happened because Taylor was feeling crazy and weird and fucking petty and you Happy. get a, you get a cool execution of that. I don't know what she's feeling right now. So if she's feeling kind of uh, sad girl season, I fear she's going to write some simple songs and Jack isn't exactly going to polish them and make them super exciting. Well, so here's my, here's my, here's my hope. And I guess my working theory, I, uh, Pete, I'm curious where you think the, the, saddest songs ever stuff is coming from because it does have like the aesthetic has a little bit of like a moodiness to it but i get a little bit more like i don't know i guess sort of glitzy nighttime almost retroiness as much as i do sadness now obviously if you're you're kept up at night yeah usually that means something's bothering you but she's released these videos talking about the things that have that have caused those sleepless nights and i think the first few that we've gotten 
One was about like self-loathing. Okay, that's not fun. One was about plotting revenge. Um, so that's maybe a little bit more fun. Uh, the last stuff that she did with Jack um, was mostly vault stuff. And uh, what would be not a happy outcome for me is if Midnight's ends up feeling like sort of an extension or a progression from the vault stuff that she worked on with, with Jack. Now, I think the production on the 10 minute all too well sounds good, which he did, but there are some other songs that are fine. But like, I think they make sense to have been left off albums. The one song that he did on Evermore with her was gold rush, which is a song that I like a lot. Same. And I do think something Jack does have a knack for. And like, I, you know, I am a little bit, one thing she's done so well throughout her career is like get to the end of the line with someone she's collaborating with and then be like, okay, I'm going to go find somebody else who can give me something new and, and push it in a new direction. I hope that she's done that by the way, Jack, on, I do have right. on pretty good authority. She like, not everyone that she reaches out to for this stuff says yes, which I find interesting. I'd never really considered before. Right. Um, but usually she finds someone else, right? And and this is going back to an old well. And I think there's some, there's some, there's a, a possibility that that seems like risk aversion that is not, I hope it doesn't end up feeling like that. But I do think that one thing that Jack is good at, and DJ, I think you're spot on. If you want to write an album about things that kept you up in the middle of the night, there are worse producers than Jack Antonoff whose thing seems to be, I'm going to let you talk your feelings out. Yeah, oh, and, totally. Or, or buds and figure out where you want to go. Nora, he's got to be... other thing... Uh, sorry, I'll, I'll just quickly say, like, I... I th- they say you should, you need to be a really good player. Like if you're in a band, you need to be, either be a really good player or a really good hang. And you can be less of one if you're more of the other. Jack Antonoff right. must be the nicest fucking person <laughs> in the world because everybody likes working with him. And it does seem like he's like the good hang. He's the person who, and again, like if if you need, if you say, hey, how can I get this sound? He can pull it up for you. But his thing really seems to be, how can I let you do what you want to do? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and like oh, and, where? And the, sorry, I was just gonna say the other thing. Let me just lay on the plane on this because okay. I think it's important. The okay. other thing that I think he's good at is I think he can make small songs sound big. And Gold Rush is a song about anxiety, essentially. It is kind of like this. It's not a huge idea. It's like an intimate song about your innermost thoughts. I think you could play that song in a stadium, and. There's a piece of the the release pattern here where I think there's kind of two possibilities with why this album is coming out right now instead of a re-release. And one of them is that she feels like she needs fresh stuff that is not cottage core that will work on tour. And the other possibility is she just really likes it and doesn't feel like it can wait. Or it's a little bit of both, right? But so my 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 hope is that the sonic touchstone is gold rush because that to me makes sense as, as a Jack production that is about a topic that could keep you up at night, but also done in a way where you could boom that thing out into to space and it would sound cool live. And it's poppy enough that a lot of people will still think it's a bop, even though it's about being like, nervous about your crush i was a gold rush guy and i i preferred evermore to folklore and what i like about gold rush is uh, another thing that jack will do and he did that with um what's like the one last good lord song um green light it, it, it'll take some left turns and actually kind of keep you interested so i agree if that's the touchstone then hell yeah yeah i guess my expectations are is not that it's going to be like sonically be the like the saddest album that she's ever had because i think it's going to be tougher to get more like sonically basic and they're not smart enough to write in minor keys don't worry <laughs> and like folklore and evermore i think you cottage core is probably the best way to to put it and uh i just think that the concept of it is like oh boy here here we go like you know 
the sleepless nights, like you mentioned, I didn't, I guess I haven't been paying close enough attention to the rollout and like the explanation of, of where some of these songs are coming from. So like, I didn't consider the fact that like, Hey, revenge could keep somebody up at night. Just like from a personal experience, if you're up all night, it's probably because you're extremely sad <laughs> or yeah. there's like ex- existential dread or something like that. It's, it's, if you're being, if you're being kept up at night, it's usually not a fun experience. Also, it could be, my therapist says this, do you keep a TV in the room? I do, but it's not on. If you if you you shouldn't look at screens that close to bedtime. <laughs> so maybe that could be it. It's That's just an album. It's just an album about Taylor Swift watching Cheers until two in the morning. <laughs> yes, hundred percent would listen to that for sure. There definitely she. So there are a couple. Um, the song with Lana Del Rey, and then the first one, which is called Lavender Haze. Both of those have been described as songs that have to do with being in love. So it's not all sad. Yeah, she said she said that she got lavender haze from um, from Mad Men. From Mad Men, which wow. I mean, I have certainly stayed up. I've kept the TV in the bedroom on late watching Mad Men, so maybe that's it. I actually do know the scene that she's talking about when where they say lavender haze. I mean, maybe they say it multiple times, but I don't know. I just love John Hamm entering the Taylor Swift universe. <laughs> oh, <laughs> John Hamm finding out he's now part of the Taylor Swift universe is you want to talk about existential dread. He's like, <laughs> I, I really don't need this, please. I just everyone, please be nice to me. Could everyone just fucking please be nice to me? That's that's all I want. Nora, we'll let you go with this. And uh, famously, this was supposed to be like a five minute. Let's get Nora on the phone. Hey, friend, what's up with Taylor Swift? Love you. Bye. And now we're like 80 minutes into it. So uh, we apologize. It's uh, com- there's just too much to shit. There it's always not your is. Fault. It's her fault. Have you? Uh, it always is. Have you heard uh, the new 1975 album? Because we've uh, definitely had you on in the past to discuss uh, Healy and the Boys. Yeah, well, so also produced by Jack Antonoff. Yeah. I like it. Love it. It sounds I love it. like every other 1975 album. But yes. I that's that's not true. No, it sounds like I love it when you sleep four years so blah, 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 which is what it's, I want. It sounds like every other 1975 album, minus all the shit that you don't want. Yes, well, correct. Right, they trim right. the fat. No, that's, that, that, was a, that, was, that was a total compliment from my end. It is, it yeah. is so not it, it, a it's, departure from anything that I'm used to from them that yeah. I like. And I think... And I, I would I would give Antonov a little bit of credit towards doing this. Trimmed some of the the self indulgent. Yes, and that's where it's, it's honestly like they listened to the the podcast that we did with Nora after the last album came out. Likely, and we kind of like were that's very definitely what happened. We were very critical of a lot of the things that they did not do in this album. Yeah, it was like, hey, cut cut out like the shit that nobody wants. Stop being so fucking pretentious. And just make the good poppy music that everybody wants. And if you need an example of the point that we raised on what Jack Antonoff can do well, look no further than this album. This doesn't necessarily sound like it was produced by Jack Antonoff. No. You're not hearing snare drums fall on top of each other with a bunch of reverb like, oh, oh, you're not getting any of that stupid shit. It just sounds like he was like, Maddie. What are you guys doing? Maddie and the other guy who write the songs, what do you want it to sound like? And if you were to tell me that Jack Antonoff didn't really do anything on this album, I'd believe that. Maybe he was just the hang. There you go. And that's a, again, that's a huge compliment to Jack Antonoff. The less that he does musically, just <laughs> the the better it can be. I, re- I do like this album, I though. need to go on record as saying I don't agree with this, but I get where DJ is coming. Nora, <laughs> I text you every hour, maybe. This is funny. I realize this is probably the first phone call. I've ever had with uh, Nora, despite I text you podcast ideas like every couple of minutes. And uh, one of them is the best of and the worst of and you two, you do the best of somebody who sucks and the worst of somebody who is great. Good. And the as maybe I didn't text you this, who knows? Uh, but like the, the first two ideas I had was like, listen to like three bad Billy Joel songs and listen to three fucking awesome Jack Antonoff songs because there uh, Jack Antonoff has done a lot of good work and there's a lot of good examples of why Jack Antonoff can be of use should he be the only producer who's a household name right now oh my god fucking no but there are there are definitely examples of like hey I'm glad Jack Antonoff was there for this and did this there's just like exactly 3 <laughs> I think there's a little bit more than that, but again, I love, I love, I love the DJ Bean pitch bot. <laughs> All right. Well, 
We appreciate you coming on with us. We're going to continue to talk uh, 1975 uh, in a few minutes, folks. But uh, yeah, thank you, Nora. Appreciate you. Groovy. All right. Thanks, Nora. Good to be with the Brunch Boys. Yeah, Yeah. talk soon. Bye. And now here's where we learn we don't know how to uh, properly hang up the phone. And now we talk shit about Nora. <laughs> she just listens and on like, the rest of the still podcast. here. <laughs> it would be funny if we were just like 14 minutes deep in the 1975 conversation. She just like chimed in with a point. We're like, ah, Nora's ah, still fuck. here. No, I, I really did plan on that being like a quick, hey, Nora, what do we miss? Here's what we missed. All right. From New York. I'm Nora. Thanks, pal. <laughs> But then we ask her, we, Nothing, we just ask her a billion questions. We, we can't do that with a friend. Like, yeah. it just doesn't work that way. Yeah. But I do want to talk about the 1975 album. Uh, it came out last week. If you know me, I, I've become a gigantic 1975 head. A stan. Yeah, over the past few years. This one, it, it it's up there with, with my favorite albums for all the reasons that we just previously mentioned. There's very little fat on it. They, like... They're not quite as annoying. It is a weird listening experience, like initially, because it is definitely their most genuine album. It's uh, definitely their most earnest, uh, and but it it still does have like the sprinklings of like, oh yeah, and here's me talking about my dick, uh, and so it, it has. They didn't completely abandon the the goofy shit that you like about the 1975, but. Uh, it is more accessible, I would say, to a wider audience. It's it's my favorite 1975 album. It's weird that I'm the same age as Maddie Healy. It's weird that like Maddie Healy is an old guy now, and he's entering his I don't know whatever era, like his kind of crotchety. He's always been a little crotchety, but he's a very he's a way more online. Uh, less uh, cagey version of Josh Tillman. And I don't like to compare them, but it's such an obvious comparison to make because they're both fucking monster lyricists. Mm -hmm. I think that Tillman's on a, on another level, but like nobody really does exactly what Maddie Healy does. And this album sounds good the whole way. As you said, there's not a lot of like kind of, noise or nonsense i you get most of the lyrics and that's another like difference i guess between him and tillman like there's not as much reading into that needs to be done if you listen to the words he's saying he's quite literal a Mm -hmm. lot of the time but it's like if josh tillman had any interest in being a pop star (laughs) yes right and i it's funny because i've always made that comparison with uh, i've said that phoebe bridgers is that like if josh tillman wanted to play the game and be America's sweetheart, Mm -hmm. he could do what Phoebe Bridgers does. He would just be Matt Healy. Right, but Matt Healy might be the better example. But Matt Healy is also kind of tortured by uh, the fact that he does that. Like, I bet that he (laughs) wishes he weren't online so much. What are some of your uh, favorite songs on this? I mean, the first one... I mean, I will say all the the songs that came out um, pre-release, part of the band, I'm in love with you, Happiness, and I believe All I Need to Hear was also released. All of those songs are very good. Yeah. And that's because there's not really a a, a, a bad song on the album. Uh, but, I mean, Oh, Caroline is the best best of the non-released songs, in my opinion. Uh, that song, it might be one of my most favorite 1975 songs. You had an extremely astute take. You texted me and said... I uh, I hadn't listened to it yet, but you said uh, "Oh Caroline" sounds like it could be on Sob Rock, and I was like, "Okay, let me check it out." Listen to it a couple of times, and it's the same instrumentation as uh, "Last Train Home," just with sample drums instead of live drums, and it absolutely sounds like it would be on Sob Rock. Yeah, I mean, just my simple brain was like, "Okay, here's this song that very much sounds like it was molded in like an '80s style, professional and, '80s music." Yeah, and uh, it's just like. I don't know. It's it's such a good simple song, uh, and I fucking love that it does have a little bit of. Um, it is a little jokey, but also very sincere. Uh, the the line like uh, "Oh Caroline," I couldn't find. Like I've searched like a thousand names, but yours is the only one that rhymes. So Caroline. <laughs> Like, it's just because I I read up that like they were looking for like a thousand different names that would work for that song. And then they decided on Caroline because it's three syllables and it rhymes. 
if there's a kind of thesis to be taken from this album, it's that you don't need good choruses to make fun, good songs. Happiness and I'm in love with you both have like pretty lame choruses. They just kind of ride the momentum that their verses have given them. And that is totally fine. Mm -hmm. I like, I really like both of those songs while acknowledging. Yeah. Like they probably wrote this song in order. I don't think they came up with the choruses and then they were like, fuck, how do we fill some stuff around this? Like they just probably got the train rolling. And then when they got to the chorus, they were like, fucking cares. We'll just (laughs) don't, don't bore us. Get back to the verse. And that's cool. Um, Two songs that I definitely want to talk about. My favorite song on the album is part of the band. And when I first heard it, I was like, uh, just like from the first verse, you're like, we get it. You've been hanging out with Phoebe Bridgers, but it's lyrics are so fucking good. I love how disjointed the verse in the chorus are. It has just Tillman level court awareness lyrically where you're just like through. And we're going to talk about the band planes in a little bit where I, I'm just reacting like I'm at a rap concert hearing like when you when you hear like a really good line in rap, you, it just like hits you. You're just like, ah, ah, like, ah, oh, fuck. Yeah, they, they fucking did that. I got that in the uh, second verse of this song. He says, I know some vaccinista tote bag chic baristas sitting east on their communista keisters writing about their ejaculations. I like my men like I like my coffee, full of soy milk and so sweet it won't offend anybody. That's so fucking good. <laughs> A, because we were texting about this. People are going to take ejaculations to mean that he's talking about his dick. And I think that he's actually using... I don't know if this is the original definition of the word, but ejaculation also does mean like... uh, like Maybe like outburst or yell. You could obviously understand how it would also mean uh, to ejaculate. But like the idea of like, I know some fucking like hoity toity people who write about shit that they've yelled at people. That is like straight out of uh, Ballad of the Dying Man. And then the line, I like my men like I like my coffee, <laughs> full of soy. <Mwah. laughs> oh, so fucking good. He is an outstanding fucking lyricist yeah i mean uh look no further than when we are together when he says uh uh sea Wor- central park is sea world for trees <laughs> yes just the stupidest line uh when we are together also has a, a line that made me laugh out loud in the second verse about uh the day we both got canceled uh, it was poorly handled the day we both get, both got canceled uh because i'm a racist and you're some kind of slut like that was incredible because that's obviously a, a wink back to uh oh yeah no that the, is like yeah. the George Floyd thing when he uh, had to delete his Twitter account I believe twice yeah that was uh an ugly day for for Matty Healy but I do think that the way that he slipped that in into like a very beautiful song was hilarious famously Matty Healy the musician who has said uh, the most offensive thing about George Floyd I'm gonna quickly bring up a point there by the way like Kanye obviously not well. Obviously saying horrible shit. Shame on so many people who are like, wait, you're saying horrible shit and you're a famous person who actually likes saying horrible shit. We need famous people who say horrible shit. We need black people who say horrible shit. Come on. And like, it's just fucking disgusting from so many fucking people. But um, I was listening to the great Pusha T album that came out this year. And I've just been revisiting it a lot lately independent of Kanye stuff, not like this has put me in a mood to listen to Kanye, but I was listening to Dreamin' of the Past, which is the best song on that album, and it samples Donny Hathaway's version of Jealous Guy, and I never really get this fucking high horsey when it comes to sampling and shit like that, but I was like, man, if fucking Donny Hathaway, who died of mental illness, and... John Lennon, who was so fucking horny for peace, heard Kanye West doing shit with their song. They really would be fucking like spinning in their grave right now. So fucking bummer. Hope Kanye gets better. But Jesus fucking Christ. Brutal. Uh, The other song I want to talk about is uh, Looking for Somebody. Mm -hmm. It's a great example of uh, it's kind of love it if we made it. Not sonically, but in that. 
it's just a banger about something horrible. Yeah. Like, clearly about school shootings. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. But fucking great song. I don't want a dance song about school shootings, but it's very impressive that that can be done. I also think that it's like, uh, it's from an interesting interesting perspective and kind of the perspective that you would want uh, where it's like, you can't understand it. Like, Matty Healy said he wrote the song because he was like, I just can't fucking understand school shootings and this is me trying to, like, figure it out. Mm. And so, like, that is an appropriate way to write about school shootings, I would think. Yeah. Uh, not, uh, not Jeremy. Right. But uh, it's, I think it's a, a palatable way to kind of dive into that subject. I haven't done much of the Matty Healy press tour. And unlike Father John Misty, like he will jump in and he will do any fucking interview that's uh, tossed his way. And sometimes that's comfortable for the interviewer. Sometimes it isn't. But he does. He really seems like a fucking nice man. Um, I watched a clip, though, of him with Zane Lowe. And given how unhinged the Zane Lowe interview with John Mayer was, I just wanted to see how Zane's doing these days. And the only clip that I saw of it was uh, they were talking about paid meet and greets, which I considered getting you when Carly Rae Jepsen was in town, but I fucking forgot. Okay. And uh, he was saying, they were just saying like how disgusting it is. And uh, Healy brought up that it's a lot of passing the buck on the part of the artist where when you go to buy your ticket, it's like, do you want to pay another $250 and meet the artist? And you're like... Sure, Ticketmaster, I'll give you $250, but that's not what's fucking happening. The artist is saying, if they want to give me more fucking money, then they can meet me. So he said you should only be able to do meet and greets as an artist if uh, the payment is given to you on site. So when the person comes up to take their picture with you, they have, they have to you give you a 20 Yeah. <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> just uh, Matty Healy taking pictures with the fans who's just holding like a, like a gas station attendant, a, like a huge stack of cash. Wad. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but he wasn't saying it in a funny way. He was saying it in like an exasperated way. It's like, yeah, well, you, you there should be like a little bit of transparency as to what's happening here. Yeah. It's like, I am not your pal. You're paying me to take a picture with me. <laughs> All right. We're in a rush now, but the other album that I can't stop fucking listening to is Planes. I Walk With You Always. Katie Crutchfield, Jess Williamson. I recommend that album probably even more than I recommend the 1975 album. It's so fucking good. But we have to talk about Halloween Ends. Halloween Ends. Uh, the third installment of the new Halloween trilogy. Uh, I was fascinated heading into this movie because we both loved the original. Or I don't want to say the original. The, um, the 2018 the, one. The, the reinstallment one. of Halloween, just called Halloween. We both loved it. I think we both saw it multiple times in theaters. Mm -hmm. We're very excited about the direction of the where this was going. Uh, then immediately brought da back down to earth with Halloween Kills, which I think we can both agree. Fucking horrible Terrible. movie. Terrible movie. Um, and like sort of... It, it was a weird experience because it was like during COVID, um, it was released straight to Peacock, I want to say. Um, so it didn't feel like a, like a real movie, you know? It like felt like... A bad movie. Yeah. It, I mean, that didn't help either. But like it did not... I was willing to like kind of just write that movie off completely. And like if they landed the plane with this third one, I would have been like, okay, great job doing this, uh, this like renewal of Michael Myers and Halloween. But I got to say, the third one, a big disappointment for me. So I liked this movie. Most people did not like this movie because the this movie focuses on Haddonfield and an ostracized young man, Corey Cunningham, who becomes the protege of Michael Myers. And in a vacuum, I like that. And this movie, as just a Blumhouse horror movie, is a solid Blumhouse horror movie that I walked away from saying, well, that fucking rocked. I laughed. I did this and everything. But most people, understandably so, cannot reconcile that the final movie of this trilogy and something that's supposed to conclude the Michael Myers story focuses on somebody else more than Michael Myers. Yeah, that's exactly how I feel about it. It's just like this movie would have been awesome had it been number two. One hundred percent. In the, in the uh, if this if we had just completely scrapped Halloween Kills, moved this to the second one, had a different ending, and then focused on Michael Myers because in the third one that would have been amazing. Because this movie does do 
some things well. I like exploring what It's hap- not a bad plot. No, it's not a bad plot. It's a it, bad plot for a the, conclusion. It's a bad plot for a conclusion. It's it's a bad way to land the plane for a franchise that has fo- focused on Michael Myers for like 30 years. Except <laughs> for Halloween 3. Yikes. Well, I I have not gotten that halloween 3 they didn't have michael myers they were like oh no the halloween franchise isn't about michael myers it's just about bad things happening on halloween and people were like like fucking hell it is (laughs) get Uh, those two fuckers back so yeah i mean push push it to number two and tweak some things and i would be very okay with this movie i think it does a lot of things well like i said i like the idea of exploring haddonfield in like a post michael myers world and kind of like seeing how the town would eat itself with without Michael Myers even killing people. Uh, I think that's an interesting dynamic to explore. I don't want to see it in the third installment. Um, like, I, I didn't even... I think that Corey was, like, a fine I enough character. I did fucking absolutely love the opening scene of, of uh, this movie, of Halloween Ends. The opening scene is awesome. It's extremely dark. It's extremely, like whoa, fuck, what am I in for? And so, like, after this, the, like, once the, 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 uh, the, the title scene, the title credits kicked in, I was like, oh, shit, okay, this Buckle is gonna up. be awesome. Most yeah. devastating opening scene to a movie since Midsommar, I think. Yeah, that's totally fair. That was, that's a really good, uh, that's a really good comparison. So, I don't have a problem with less Michael Myers, and using less Michael Myers, you didn't know it as it was happening, led to so many good and smart moments. In the first 35 minutes of this movie, you have a babysitting scene and a party scene and neither have Michael Myers. And after the party scene, I was like, yo, this movie fucking rocks because now I've now had two scenes where I've been like, Jesus, and I'm just like fucking white knuckling it, looking at all the, like, they're watching Halloween movies, they're doing this, and it doesn't fucking come. And it's like, your heart's just fucking beating and this is all you realize as you're seeing it. And Michael Myers is in this movie. He teams up with uh, Corey and they do stuff together. Uh, but it's like a weird dynamic even when he is in it and he's like kind of weak. And it's like yeah. the first time that we've ever seen Michael Myers like this weak and like yeah. frail. And it's a weird experience. But this is all going to set up a battle royale between Lori and and Michael. Corey is going to bring Michael to Lori, and Michael is helping Corey because Corey is stooping Allison. That's a good storyline where this is all going to culminate, and we're only getting little drips and drabs of Michael, just little bits and pieces. But this fucking ends with the fucking battle royale, and that showdown is just super disappointing and just kind of lame and short. The biggest, the most interesting part and the most suspenseful part of the final act is between Corey and Lori. Like that's way more interesting when that, that L- Lori is... basically baits Corey and traps him. Like that stuff, very good. All I mean, all of like the good battles that are in this movie are with Corey taking, assuming like the role of Michael Myers. Yeah. And again, that that works if then a bigger, better thing is coming with Michael, where mm-hmm. Michael's like Hey, let me fucking show you how it's done, kid. You know how Michael Myers talks. And then there's the big fucking <laughs> ending. Instead, he's you fucking don't get washed, that. dude. Like he's the most washed. I mean, he's famously been lit extremely on fire. Yeah, but he's that he's, he recovered enough to kill everybody in the But Halloween that's like kills. the lore of Michael Myers is that like he takes all this fucking damage and somehow Never dies. Like he, he came back strong. He got lit on fire. Came back in Halloween Kills. Got jumped by the entire town and still like was stronger than all of them. Yeah. So it doesn't make any fucking sense why all of a sudden he's just like this weak, frail old man. Like, and the the final battle was just really frustrating uh, and, and disappointing, and especially after he'd been sidelined for like the entire movie. Okay, let's get to the funny stuff in this movie. Uh, Lori is writing a memoir, which is just the worst and really lame, although it did lead to this incredible tweet. Were you a Sex in the City guy? No, not really. I wish that Nora were here for this. Uh, there's a tweet from Tom Zohar with pictures of Lori writing, and it said, Oh, I did And see as that, I yeah. faced up against Michael for the 507th time, I couldn't help but wonder, 
will I end Halloween or will Halloween <laughs> end me? Which is basically I end, every yeah. Sex in the City <laughs> yeah. episode. Yeah, uh, yeah, that was that's pretty good. Um, I, while we're talking about funny stuff, I mean, the fact that Corey is not the son of Richard Kind is good call. unbelievable. He has the exact same face. And you know how many people on earth have the exact same face as Richard Kind? That one kid. One. Yeah. <laughs> That's him. <laughs> uh, Lori says, Lori's a little unhinged in this movie. She says, it makes you want to rip off your shirt and show grief your fucking tits. And I'm like, I, again, like theoretically in this in this franchise, you've only been terrorized twice. You're not like a fucking celebrity, Lori. Relax. No, but she spent her entire life preparing to be terrorized yeah and that's sort of like the theme of the first half yeah, of this he movie. killed her daughter true yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah just that small little detail fine um also i mean like when you were talking about the the fact that they had the babysitting scene and the party scene and, and michael myers didn't show up and you were still on edge i think that lends to like experiencing life in a post michael myers world where it's like you're constantly on edge waiting for him to happen and it does do some like psychological warfare and it's like him not showing up doesn't mean that he's still not like felt yeah and that so they do a good job of giving that to the viewer because obviously Haddonfield is doing that with how they treated Corey uh Corey is involved in a tragedy and he's then ostracized because everyone's like oh evil Mm -hmm. because fucking Michael Myers terrorized that town and it's it's like exploring like well is he evil because the town made him that way or is he evil because he just has it in him? Pete, it's a classic nature versus That's nurture. That's right. Um, also, Will Patton is sort of in this movie. We stand late era Will Pat Blumhouse Will Patton, but he he uh, does not appear to be of a, a law enforcement figure anymore. He's just a horny old man who is dying to star in the Cialis commercials. Yeah, he really wants to strip Lori. Uh, Corey lures Officer Mullaney, Allison Stalker, into Michael Myers' Myers' lair, props him up, and says to Michael, uh, what does he say? He says, teach me. (laughs) I wish the first words that Michael Myers spoke were, no, you you pretty much did the hard part. (laughs) Seems like you got it, pal. Now you you stab him. (laughs) You asking, teach me how to stab somebody? You're holding a knife. Let's. I, I, it's the way I. I. My. I love my mom, but the way I am when my mom's like, "Hey, how do I do this thing on my phone?" And I know it's an intuitive thing. Mm-hmm. I'm like, "Here's how you do it. I promise. Try. <laughs> because you'll. Because it's very intuitive. And then when, like when you feel your way you'll through it, it out. you know how to do it. And then you won't. It's like you raised me. You were. You'll yeah. You out. remember it easier if you do it yourself and everything. So I wish Michael Myers said that to Corey. Okay. He was like, oh, this is my protege? Well, I've got my, he like breaks the fourth wall. He's like, I've got my work cut out for me, <laughs> don't I, kids? Um, the There's not much, uh, there's not like a ton of interesting side character shit that happens in this one. One that I did appreciate was, uh, um, and or Allison, Allison's character does not get the promotion that she wants at work. Yeah, and it's because her boss is fucking one of the coworkers, mm-hmm. and then they both get murdered. That uh, that's one of like the fun, like ooh, I hope these people die. Yeah, so they've done a great job with Allison this whole f- series, and she is a fucking idiot in this movie. Yeah. How does she not know? So somebody is now killing everybody. In Haddonfield, except everybody is somebody uh, who like slighted Allison. <laughs> people who work with Allison slighted her, and the people who are being mean to Corey, <laughs> the kids who. So there, there. Corey's got some bullies. It's so uh, there's some real like stepbrothers energy here, where Brennan can't walk home a certain way, right? Because yeah. the kids bully him. Corey's got a bit of that. There are some high school kids who bully him, and he's like 25 or something like that. They're really mean to him. He uh, kills the fuck out of them. Oh, yeah. And then he kills... And fucks up their car. Yes, even worse. Uh, He uh, kills Allison's co-workers, and he kills the radio DJ who upsets Allison. Mm Mm-hmm. Allison live on at air. No point. Kills him live on air. Yeah, and that song was good. Allison at no point is like... We got some bad luck, don't we, kiddo? <laughs> this is a fucking coincidence. What a coinky dink. A lot of breaking the fourth wall. 
in this movie. Uh, yeah, but I, I didn't dislike this movie. Uh, I, I was disappointed. I, I understand everyone's yeah. disappointment, of course. I, I don't think that it was a piece of shit. I, um, I think it's probably the most, my worst, my least favorite movie where it's like, okay, there are some things they did well, but it wasn't fully fleshed out and they fucked up to a sort of irreparable degree. All right. Where it's uh, like the things that they did well really like are not enough for what they fucked up. Second favorite of these this trilogy? Still put Halloween kills worst or Yes. Oh yeah. I mean, I could see if if you were very disappointed in this movie, I could see how like the stakes were higher so you could say even if this no. is a like again, this is I think. Do you agree this is a this is like a a likable Blumhouse movie if it's not yeah, the, if there's another one coming, I'm it, this movie is not going to deter my interest of the third movie. If you hadn't seen Halloween Kills and you didn't know this was kind of a Rocky trilogy, um, if this was the second one that you'd seen coming off of the 2018 Halloween, you would be like, be this franchise for the third one. fucking it's rocks! Back. <laughs> yeah. Holy God, all these guys with a million names that yeah. wrote this and Danny McBride, great fucking job. That's uh, Halloween ends. Let's do two fucking minutes on planes, please. Isn't it good? It is very, very good. I, it, it's. It, I it, love it, Waxahachie. Yes, it's country music, but it's like the, I don't know what the expression is. It's like three chords in the truth. Something like that. No idea. I think they say it at some point in A Star is Born. It's just so fucking professional. It's so good. Katie Crutchfield, Waxahachie, could fucking sing about like specific instructions on how to kill me and I would show it to my parents yeah because it's same. so fuck I love this album so much that they're playing the night that the Chargers are on Sunday Night Football I'm gonna skip the fucking Chargers game because I can't miss seeing this album played it is so fucking good cannot recommend strongly enough Abilene Hurricane problem with it every song on the album is awesome Abilene just fucking makes me weep it, yeah. it makes me weep for for something that didn't even happen to me. I think Hurricane's my favorite uh, so far, but like it's there are all the songs are extremely enjoyable, and it's not. I was afraid that I was going to be like, all right, I don't know who Jess Williamson is. Uh, I'm going to listen to only the ones that Katie Crutchfield sings, and my favorite song on the album right now is Abilene, which is sung by Williamson. Like there, it nobody's pulling more weight than the other. This is no. a fucking power. It's, it's honestly like pretty difficult to even like to tell. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, there, th that was sort of my, um, my reservation too. It's like, okay, I love Waxahachie, but don't know who this other person is. Am I going to like this project? It's, it's just like an extension of Waxahachie. And if you haven't heard Waxahachie, listen to her 2020 album, St. Cloud. It is outstanding and the band they put together for this tour is ridiculous they just started posting some videos of themselves rehearsing and i am so excited friend of the podcast eric slick is on drums that album rocks listen to it fucking yeah patreon.com slash listen to brunch for carla ray jepson and taylor on friday hell yeah